Welcome to Alex and Annie, the relevant of Vacation Rentals. I'm Alex. And I'm Annie. And we are joined today by a whole group of incredible men that have been part of this industry for a very long time. We are calling them, and they are, the OGs of the panhandle. And we're going to go around and let everybody introduce themselves. But Jim, do you want to start first? You're in the second tile there. <laughs> yeah, I got moved up. Um, <laughs> I'm Jim Olin. I'm the oldest one of this group by far. Definitely. Start. Yeah, yeah. Thanks a lot, Paul. Um, <laughs> moved to the Panhandle. I'm a native Floridian. So is my wife, kids. All the kids were born in Florida. Moved to the Panhandle in 89 and then started with Abbott Resorts in 92 and uh, helped grow that one. We were gonna go public and then Resort Quest bought us instead. And uh, I, I ended up running Resort Quest both as uh, chief operating officer, then as president, then as CEO. Sold that off to Gaylord in uh, end of 02. Um, I did not have a non-compete. So within six months I had started up Sterling Resorts with several partners, including one that's on this call, Mr. Karen, who was my partner at the time with Sterling. And then we sold that in 08, Steve, it was yeah. 08. 08. And since then, and even before we sold it, I was, I've been doing M&A work in the industry since day one. I mean, at Abbott, we were buying companies. So we, my son and I own C2G Advisors and we do uh, M&A work now exclusively. So that's kind of it. I, I am on this claim to fame, hired two out of the three people that are on this call. The only one I didn't hire, uh, I wouldn't. He's just not good enough. Well, I turned him down. I turned him down twice. So. You did. You actually did turn me down. Yeah, I know all these guys way too well. <laughs> so with that, I guess maybe we go down to Steve since you were automatically brought into this conversation here. So I also moved to the, uh, I'm a Floridian, but uh, did a stint flying airplanes for the Air Force in Japan and moved from Japan to the Emerald Coast in uh, 89 as well. And uh, kept on flying, doing stuff for a few more years. I met Jim. He was, uh, he couldn't print. It was really the big deal. He just couldn't print. So I came That's in true. and uh, interviewed with him. He said, look, you know, uh, you're, I need my network fixed. You're probably going to have it fixed in six months. And uh, and then I probably won't need you anymore, but you know, we, we'd love to have you. That was, the, that was the, uh, the, uh, the interview basically. And I reminded him that he was entering into the black hole of technology he was never coming out. And uh, sure enough, that's what happened. And uh, so Jim and I did the Abbott and the, uh, the resort quest story together. We did take off the, had the greatest summer ever took, took time off as resort quest continued to pay us our full salaries, which was phenomenal. Yes. And, uh, and then we started a company and they continued to pay us our full salaries, and took the unit, <laughs> which was a great experience. And then we sold that, as Jim said, in 2008. Uh, I went off and did a series of startups in the VR gateway and sold that to that. That became part of what was Vacation Roost, did uh, some international wholesale for a while, made my escape to get out. As Jim's always said before, this is a cult. So you get out, but you always get pulled back in yep. uh, <laughs> back, uh, <laughs> as one of the partners at iTrip. And then... Uh, you know, that that was really there to to take it to the next step as the the, the founders wanted to exit, and uh, that exit happened in 2019 with Inhabit, and then uh, I ran that for another number, couple of years, and then last year I moved into the managing director of, uh, of Vacation mm -hmm. for Inhabit, so I'm actively still working uh, in the game uh, in a in the roll up PE world. Nice. What about you, Lino? Yeah, so uh, Lino Maldonado. Uh, actually, Jim brought me into this business in 1996. Actually started me 4th of July weekend on the beach in 1996. I'm still a little pissed about that. <laughs> <laughs> Bring it yeah. right into the fire. <laughs> yeah. Made up, made up title, made up role. I was guest services coordinator, which meant that I was responsible for any house that was that grossed greater than 75,000 bucks. Right. Uh, and I had to go door to door every week and meet all the guests and facilitate any need that they had, housekeeping, maintenance, where to go for dinner and the like. And, you know, initially it was, uh, it was a role that um, uh, was very, you know, sort of loose. I didn't really understand how it fit into the bigger world, but I think as I reflect back, it was the role that taught me the most about the customer base really true sense of hospitality and how to meet, you know, ever-changing expectations of very high-end and demanding guests. So really good learning uh, curve there. 
and then went through the whole Abbott Resorts, you know, roll up to Resort Quest, the uh, Resort Quest uh, sale to Gaylord. And then I came back with a group in 2007, June of uh, 07. We bought Resort Quest back from Gaylord uh, yeah. and really got back down to the basics with the business. We uh, eliminated the entire corporate structure and literally uh, our C-suite was five people. Uh, and we moved those five people into our call center in uh, Fort Walton Beach because we wanted to have the people making the decisions as close to the business as we possibly could get them. And I wanted to be in the call center because I wanted to hear the phones ringing or not. And, and if not, why not? And, and be able to move very quickly on, uh, on the business. Probably what, what taught me that uh, the centralization of the business is really more of a problem than an opportunity. Uh, and I think you're, you're seeing that play out in real time today with, uh, with some other groups. You're welcome for that call center, by the way. Yeah, it's a nice car. It's a converted Walmart. I love it. And so one of these things doesn't belong. Yes. All. Yeah. That's well, so I, uh, I am not a native Floridian, so I'm from Tennessee originally, uh, Paul Wolford. But I uh, got my start in the hotel business. I uh, moved around the country with Hyatt Hotels and eventually Renaissance Hotels. And then in 1999, made the brilliant decision to go into the vacation rental space. <laughs> leaving one owner of a great hotel where all the units match and are uh, a lot of capital investment to go to 1500 owners at Sandestin where I started. Mm -hmm. I started last century as well, but more recently in the last century than my counterparts, I started in December of 99 at Sandestin and spent several years there and then moved east over to Panama City Beach where I joined a company called Resort Collection and grew that and worked here and uh, Part of what we did several years ago, which some may know, is got in the call center business. And uh, three years ago, we sold our vacation rental contracts. And I continued on in the call center world, growing and expanding our call center world to where we are today. And that's what I do today. And I've known these guys and learned from these guys for years. And uh, I can tell you, when I started at Sandestin, my drive to work from where I lived was four traffic lights. And today it's 27. So <laughs> it has just grown enormously in Northwest Florida and changed. And uh, But that's where uh, I cut my teeth and that's where I sit today. Yeah, I, I remember when we built the Abbott also, or the Abbott Central Office, which back then was in the middle of nowhere in Destin, pre-bridge. Also remember after Hurricane Opal in 95, when we're standing there with no power, Bill Abbott handed one of my texts and handed Andy a hundred bucks. We, we drove over, Andy drove over to one of the, the power guys and said, here's a hundred bucks. Can you turn our pole jacks on? They flipped our jacks and the call center was back live faster than anybody else. That was the kind of influence that they had back then. It was able, we were able to make things happen in the marketplace and it was pretty great. And there were three traffic lights in Destin or something. Yeah. And if we all knew what we know today, we'd all own property on 30A. And yeah. a lot of and, Amen to that. And, yeah. yeah, we'd be counting our money. Well, whenever I hang out with any of you guys, and Annie included, it always makes me jealous that I, I don't live down in the panhandle because we always joke on the show that there's just such great minds that grew up in that area of Florida and so much of the technology and development and you know, guest services, all sides of the business came from a lot of the bricks that you guys were laying back then, whether you knew it or not. It's amazing to look back on it. And Steve, I remember when you came on our show about two years ago, you told us about the AS 400s and it was basically like duct tape keeping things together. And just, gosh, how much, you know, has changed since then. But um, well, we had the net, we had the beach network. In, in, in 90, by 96, 97, we had that entire beach area in a network when people didn't even hardly use computers. And we, we had already built a virtual environment across all of the areas. And I do recall one of our, I was with Joanne Saucier out on 30A and we were uh, turning up one of the locations and one of the managers said, well, what do we do if the computer doesn't work? And she's like, you take their money and you give them a key. And, <laughs> and they were like, Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, you know, Joanne should probably be on this call. Uh, she, she was our director of operations with Abbott, and um, we brought her on in a consulting role when we took over um, Resort Quest in 07. And, and now she's with us with Scenic Stays, uh, our little rental and real estate business oh, in the panhandle. So, yeah, she's still active and as ornery as ever, but, <laughs> but probably the most knowledgeable of anybody on this call.
Yeah, she's yeah. way smarter than Jim, I know. So Oh know. my gosh. Yeah. When, in board <laughs> meetings, in board meetings, she would just chew me and spit me out. And she worked for me. Oh, yeah. she, her favorite comment was that stupid. And I'm like, oh. thank you. Thank you. But, but, and that's why she's respected right. so well. That's is right. That's she exactly can, right. Give you the actual yeah. news that you don't want to hear but need. Yeah. And and then, you know, make the appropriate decisions. Yeah, you know, when I think about the panhandle here and all the folks and influences and talent we've had, I think there's something very unique about this space. You know, Paul and I have actually been competitors. And Steve, when you guys were with Sterling Resorts, competitors. Yep. But we have a, a phrase that I like to use, uh, coopetition, uh, mm -hmm. is that even though we're in the same business competing for employees and units and, and everything else that goes along with it, we work together as a group for the betterment of the industry uh, right. in our markets and in others. And it's amazing as you travel to all these different um, uh, government affairs, you know, issues, it's the same small group that attends and, and tries to push things forward that it was 25 years yeah. ago. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Same yeah. stage. Actually one of our customers these days. So we still work. You know, you're either going to work with each other, compete against each other, you know, or, uh, or work for one of them. Right. It just seems like you always kind of, there, there's the same people you move around in this industry and, you know, the, the competition idea is really the right answer is because there's so much opportunity and it's, it's really about lifting the, lifting the, the tide for everybody in this process. Yeah. And that's Very really true. kind of where Atma, the on-site property yeah. manager, <laughs> yeah. really where it was yeah. birthed is it, yeah. it was really frustrating that we all thought we had this secret that nobody else did and we wouldn't share those secrets. And it, it was crazy to me that we didn't try to help each other get better and try to make the industry better. And, uh, and we did that and we continue to do it, but it's, we're not rocket science. We don't have the answer to get to the moon. We have the answer to try to take care of people and, and make their vacation special and make their trip special. And that's what we all care about. But, but back in the day, you know, when we're talking the early and mid nineties, you know, the only thing out here in the panhandle was condominiums and restaurants and a few traffic lights. It was the drive destination for the, the Southeast. We all just worked together. We didn't have technology back then. If we wanted to know how we were doing, we'd call up one of our competitors and say, honestly, are you ahead or behind? You know, that's how we did our as of. Hey, Dale Peterson, are you ahead or behind? Right. You know? And we'd call, the restaurants would call and say, hey, does it look like it's going to be a good weekend? That's how we all had it yeah. back then. Yeah. Uh, Steve yeah. set up the, the, I don't know what you call VPN or whatever. When he did all that, it was like, wow, you mean we can, we can know what's going on 30A without driving down there and look at the tape sheets. I mean, we were like, whoa. So like the whole world. It is unbelievable. And that was kind of the beginning of the downfall of Resort Quest because Resort Quest couldn't tie all the, the different uh, companies together to make the street happy and give guidance. We could within Abbott, but yeah. our AS400 with the native RPG and all that kind of garbage did it just for us. And so that's what really caused most of the problems at Resort Quest in the beginning was they, they rolled up something they couldn't report it. Yeah, the, the, the challenge of technology in the 90s oh. when, that, when that came about, there, were, there was a lot of bailing wire and, and duct tape. To, we, you know, David Levine announced to the street in, in uh, third quarter, late third quarter one year, we're going to have all of Resort Quest on a single website. And uh, I remember everybody on the technology side saying, really? I wonder how that's going to happen. <laughs> yeah. Nonstop, uh, literally in, yep. uh, through through Christmas to pull off a miracle to get that view. But it, there was a lot of magic going on with seven different types of operating systems with you know 25 different property management companies, polling data. And, uh, you know, it was, it wasn't pretty, but it was pretty amazing for the time today, yeah. it's kind of table stakes for getting the business, a business up and running and, you know, multi, multi location operations are a pretty, pretty much a, a given in the, in the, uh, in the technology base. But what we were doing was blazing new ground back. Then. Yeah. Blessing, you know, to me, there's a blessing and a curse and I'm in the talk technology business now with, with be home 24 seven. And, and there's a blessing and a curse with technology back then. You know, we didn't have good technology and, and you know, people crack up about the AS400 and how long we were on it and 
and the like, but uh, it was a very stable and, and accurate system that that never never crashed. We literally did not have you know a crash. And today there's still problems with technology. And, and to me, it's it's either you're leaning too much on technology to deliver a great experience, or you're not using enough technology. And then within those technologies, the problem is is integrations where you know you got a lot of point solutions to deliver certain pieces to the business, but there's there's you know that centralized uh, technology stack can get very complicated and your business you think you're getting more effective and efficient but you're, you're actually putting every department in its own silo that that then creates efficiency problems on its own you know so is technology much better today than it was or is there just newer shiny objects for us operations people to chase yeah. Well, and, and Lino and I have talked about that, you know, just last month or a couple of months ago, we get so focused on technology, we lose our focus on the hospitality side sometimes. Yeah, totally. We do. Yeah. And at That's the fun. end of the day, we all try and remember that today is the first day of somebody's vacation and yeah. they saved their money and they've focused on it and they planned for it. And they're here on the pool deck or at the beach to spend some money. And if we're so worried about technology, we got to remember to take care of those guests. And that gets lost sometimes when we get so technology focused. Like for, for Jim, since you've been, you've been around for longer than anybody <laughs> on this call. Anybody. <laughs> anybody on this call. No, just in the, just in the market. I, I was thinking about, again, to the technology point, I was thinking mm -hmm. about, I remember when we used to have to Paul, you'll remember for Panama City Beach, we reported every week to the Haas Institute over at West Florida. Mm -hmm. And now we have key data. Like that, when we got key data in the market, that was like a whole, like like the, the clouds yeah. parted, the rainbows came out. But for you, Jim, what do you think has been the single biggest piece of technology that's been added to the business that has been, I'd say like one most beneficial and one maybe most problematic? Mm -hmm. I, I didn't think I'd be alive to see today you can dynamic price houses. I, I always thought we'd get to a point with the condos, with mm -hmm. the two bedroom and the three bedroom sure. in some manner or fashion to do dynamic. I didn't quite think we'd ever get there on the houses in my lifetime. Mm -hmm. And I think that what we've seen, which uh, is uh, the two edged sword of having private equity sniffing in our in our midst, is that they start bringing in the boat floats higher when you start bringing in some people who say, okay, it is not going to be as easy as the air, airline industry, but if we do this and this. So I think that's the bright spot I've seen. The negative, and uh, it isn't one technology, the negative is I think, it, and, and Lino, you said it, I think, or Paul, it, we're taking our eyes off the ball. We're, yeah. we're still worried about making another nickel that uh, we're still doing single ply toilet paper in, in the units, or we're, we've got... Uh, 30, 30 thread count and be able to look through the sheet. And uh, we got to keep our eye on that ball. Okay. Don't tell me you're spending $10 million just because the street wants you to hear you're spending 10 million or 20 million on, on technology. When, when they walk in the unit, they'll never come back because I don't want to go there, but it's kind of gross. It's just, yeah. you know, I was telling a story in an all hands meeting to the, the, to my vacation division the other day. And I was, I was telling a story about, uh, remember how you, you the, the annoying way you used to make us answer the phone at Abbott. Thank you for calling Everett Resorts. Your vacation is our our business. How may <laughs> I help you? <laughs> that was it. But in there, 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 the subtle message to everybody was your vacation is our business. And, it, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and I, in, in the world I'm in today, you know, we're servicing vacation rental businesses, short term rental businesses. I the way I relate it to them is you know, our vacation, you know, your vacation business is our business. And you got to know what business you're in. You're in the business, yeah. Paul. You said, right? We're in the business of, of helping guests and travelers have a great vacation. You know, I'm in the business today of helping property managers make their owners a lot of money and have a great experience with their owners, so they can gain and retain more owners. They can't do that without having great businesses with their guests. We have to know the business we're in, and I think when we lose sight of that, and, and technology can enable it, and and if you apply the right technology and the sufficient technology but you have to have a focus on how does this business work? Owners matter, guests matter. And if we lose sight of those two pieces, the technology is the part that enables it. It's not the business. That's such a good point. It's such a good point. And I feel like, you know, that's just something that, I mean, to anchor back to why we're doing any of the things or employing any of the software that we bring onto our businesses, we're in the businesses, the business of relationships and of memories. 
And at the end of the day, I mean, things that can make the business easier for us, that's great. But what we have seen in the more recent years is, you know, these more boutique style, smaller rental companies that they're doing hospitality, memory making exceptionally well and doing it to a level that, you know, a, a huge company like a Sterling or Resort Quest, like that just would have been very hard to do at that level of scale. But just, you know, kind of on that topic, would like to get, you know, any, anybody's thoughts on how do you take that curated experience and how can companies be able to scale that to create those memories and really impactful stays? Let yeah. me throw one thing in and then I'll, I'll, I don't want to dominate, okay. but circle <laughs> uh, yeah. back to what Lino said because uh, early on, because it was so, it, we threw him in. Joanne was the one that came up with it. I wish I could take credit. But when I went to Joanne and said, I met this guy, no brainer, we got to hire him. She's the one that said this new phenomenon called detached houses, which are not, were not huge at the time. Um, they were growing and 75 grand in the mid nineties was pretty good. These houses, what are they doing now? You know, 300, 400, 400 more. More. Or more. More. <laughs> well, we wanted more of them. Lino had to meet every owner every time they were in town. He climbed underneath the buildings because they're all on stilts and cleaned up the rubbish that gets caught under there before the guests arrived. He talked to the guests and guess what? We didn't lose one unit. That's a, an example uh, and I'm not saying, but those boutique places, they can do that. Yeah. You know? And I'm not saying you got to do it at every place, but there's some basic things you can do in a unit, every unit to make it hospitable. Okay. Like I named two, you know, <laughs> nice sheets and toilet paper. The boutique guys can focus on meeting guests at the, at the unit is a fabulous thing to do. It takes a lot mm -hmm. of money and a lot of effort, but it is a game changer. And we lose sight of that. And we do. And we, you know, guests, we always used to say here at Resort Collection, our guests leave with two things. They leave with a memory and a folio. And if that memory is more important than the folio, they'll come back. If that folio is more important to them and gets more focused than the memories, they're not coming back. They're going somewhere else. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you think about the, this is the hospitality industry we're in. What does that mean? It means we're in an industry that's that's designed to deliver great experiences to other people. And, and there's a thousand things on a daily basis that that you can you know turn to from that perspective. But there's a reason that local wins. You know, there's a re I mean, our scenic stays yeah. business, we've doubled every single year and we're on a trajectory to continue that you know into the future. And we're up against some pretty big names. Some of our old former colleagues are still in the game. And and we, we win most of those discussions because I think as you aggregate these companies, you think you need to centralize more and more of the business. And the reality is you're pulling too much resource away from where it matters most. And that's in front of the owners and the guests. And so, you know, it, it's, it isn't, as Paul said, it's not rocket science, it's basic hospitality stuff. And, and I, I hate to hear the most recent Vacasa layoffs, another 320. I would argue that they are probably still way uh, top heavy, too top heavy. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. not enough resource going to where it matters most, and that's in front of the owners and the guests to do the things that that these uh, other three guys have, have really outlined. But it takes a, a concerted effort and focus to to deliver on hospitality. That's the business they're in, and you can't run this business off of spreadsheets from a central location. It you got to be close to the business on a day to day basis, and you're not competing with other large brands. Uh, Annie, I know you're. You know, with a, a great you know brand uh, today but at the end of the day when i walk into meetings competing for a building or or a, a thing marriott's not sitting in that room yeah. against me you know yeah. i'm against genie daily and sterling mm -hmm. and southern yeah. resorts and v trips and all these others that can all make decisions instantly That's and right. so if i yeah. walk in as wyndham or vacasa and i've got to take my notes from that meeting back to this big cor corporate juggernaut to get yeah. six approvals to move anything forward, I'm going to lose every single time. So yeah. I actually think being a local operations company is the perfect spot in this day and time to be in. Yeah, I, think so I have a question on that actually um, related to investment. So one of the things that like you just Vikasa is an example, like they had to kind of angle or pitch themselves as a technology company because I think technology is sexy and that's where people want to invest their money and that's what Wall Street wants to put right. their attention towards. So how does a company in hospitality, in our space, in vacation rentals, attract that money and potentially go public in a way that they don't have to compromise the core of the business, the hospitality? Because it feels like that's what ultimately has to happen to compete 
at that level. I'll just make one quick comment and then I'll, I'll turn it over. The reason I didn't um, make the turn with Vacasa uh, when we sold to them in really fall of 2019 is that what we were building was a hospitality company. Again, very small C-suite, very small middle management and lots of resource in the field to support owners and guests in, in our company culture. And I did not see that business model with Vacasa. Uh, and, and so I was like, look, I, you can't scale what you're trying to do in this industry for investment and for the other you know, components of whether it be technology or, or anything else. If you're not going to be in the hospitality business, I'm not interested you know, in, in, in being in that group. And so that, that's why specifically I made that decision. Nobody who has aggregated companies has really got that basic premise right yet. You know, mm -hmm. and, and so I think uh, that's why, you know, iTrips, you know, has done so extremely well. PMI, Casa Go, some of these mm -hmm. franchise models are doing great because they're localizing the operations. That's exactly right. And that's centralizing the headaches, right. you know. Yeah. Exactly. I remember when, when they first started and Jim was telling me about him, he was he was involved with some of the early parts. And I was like, there's no way that's going to work because it's, you know, and as I... You know, as I became a partner in the company you know, years ago, and Steve Presley said, "What do you think now?" And I was like, "Well, it's a pretty brilliant strategy because it because it's exactly what you just said, Lino. It it, it really is a diversified investor. These are investors in the business, and they have a stake, and they're local. So you get the local, and then you 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 roll up the parts that matter, the parts that you can, but you don't over control it from a central location." And it, it's kind of a, a perfect blend. There's a balance there, and you have to make sure that everybody everybody is winning along the way. But I think it's a model that can work in scale, and it's working with 108 franchisees and a bunch, you know, 130 markets. For iTrip, Casa Go's got a scale that's similar. It's a model that works because it keeps ownership local. It keeps that there, but you can roll up some pieces of the technology that drives some of the business that doesn't overburden it on one, on an individual company in one location, it's hard to have that scale. So you get the eyes of the big players out there, but you get the, right. you get the boutique care at the, at the local level. I, I think it's a model that works. I'm a believer in it. Um, I'm an investor in it. So I'm a believer in it for that reason as well, but it, it definitely works. It does work. And watching what you're doing and watching what companies, you know, I deal with Stoic Lane and, and Real Joy, yeah. some of these guys that are, that have this big halo brand out there, but they keep the local guys local and let them do what they do yeah. and just are there for support. The money's not chasing the hospitality, that's for sure. Yeah. Um, right. So they, those guys uh, let them operate at the local level and give them the support. And that's, to me, that's what works. Maybe our industry's not cut out to have 50 public companies yeah. all doing it. You know, there, this may be something, there's other ways to exit. And it may be that at certain companies, that fit a certain model, but you got to remember, we're not the ones that are dictating how we even look. And I, I feel for the guys at Vacasa right now. My personal, I mean, uh, you know, sure. some of them are my good friends. I know what it's like. I know what it's like looking at a 26 year old dweeb from Smith Barney, and he's telling me he's going to put me at a, a strong sell because yeah. I'm not going to hit my one penny off yeah. this week. A, a quick story. Real quick, when we when I first took over Resort Quest as CEO, we had all of the all of the stock people that were following us, the equity guys, all came into town. I think Lino, you helped show them around, and Ed Seymour, who was my CAO at the time, and we had them all on the balcony at Tides of Topsail, top floor, the, the the spine units, the three bedroom units at Tides, and we had them all out on the balcony. There was like twenty of them, and we were going through the spiel about, you know, it's a beautiful unit. And one guy raised his hand and said, how do you keep from these things getting trashed during spring break? And Ed said, well, the rules here are 26 years of age and above, or you got to be married. And there was this dead silence, <laughs> deafening dead silence. And you know what the guy said back? I guess none of us can stay with you. Right. <laughs> And those are the ones that are dictating Making the decisions. Yeah. 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 That's, yeah. Strong sell. That's yeah, what again. I knew. I got to get back into my shorts and my flip flops and get the heck out of Wall Street. People not in the business trying to tell the business how to run the business. And ones yeah. that have never, yeah. never worked a day in their right. life. Like, I think, I think like to the Vacasa point, and I've said this to um, a certain CEO of a company that we all know that 
you know, you can have your opinions about them, but we need them to succeed. We don't need them to fall flat on their face um, for, for a multitude of reasons. I mean, every time they have to lay off, that means they're not being as successful as they, you know, they could be. And people are affected by that. And it's, it's, it, it affects the whole industry. It affects what people look at about, you know, do you want your kids going into that business? Do you right. want to work in that business? And do you want to invest in that business? All the things. So I, I feel like we want to, we want to cheer them on. But to your point, Jim, I think it's a good, good thing to say, like, do we belong in the public space? Probably not just because mm -hmm. we're so unique from market right. to market. Just, just to think of the, the panhandle alone from one stretch of Panama city beach to the other is different. And then you start putting in all the little beaches on long 30 a, those are all completely different markets, you know, every 200 yards. So it's hard to manage, but how do I, I think, you know, what, what does success look like for a large scale company? You, Paul, you mentioned a couple like stoic lane. I mean, again, they're doing a great job, real joy, keeping that boots on the ground, like look and feel. And Alex and I talk about this all the time that I don't have a problem with people coming in and trying to like optimize operations at a high level where it's going to be a cost savings. But if you start to lose, Sterling Resorts had a really great footprint on Panama City Beach. And when they went away as Sterling Resorts, that was a big hit, not just to the business, but to the destination because they were so involved and so engaged and they were a standout operator. And that just completely went away. And I think that, you know, the more that happens, the more these beaches lose kind of their luster and their lure of being a destination. So I don't know what the answer is, but there's a lot more questions than there are answers. Well, it seems I think, like. I think Casa is, is trying to, I, you know, we haven't seen them shift. They've had a number of layoffs, right? They, there's, I think they're understanding that the technology can't be their lead. Right. Yeah. I think they understand that. And I, I think it's a, it's a sure. take time. It's a, it's going to shift over time. I think they've been shifting their, their, I think they've been more competitive. I think they've been more locally focused. And, you know, I, I think that the, I think that they're seeing where they want to go. I think it's going to take them time to get there uh, because yeah. the there is what it is. But I still think when you have an, a local owner operator, and I think that's the challenge, you can get great general managers, but they're general managers and they, and a lot of them work really hard, but the, dis, you know, the decisions don't get made a hundred percent there. And, when you have a local owner operator, the decisions are made. You can you can compete. You can you can you also show up at dinner. You show up at at, at local meetings for other things. Your owners are investors and in, in owners of your units, and you know there's that local flair that uh, that that's needed. And so yeah. I found it hard at the public level for that to occur for for a property management. Business. Attention property owners and hosts. If you want to keep those five-star cleanliness ratings soaring and your guests smiling, listen up. Introducing Turno, your ultimate solution for simplifying and automating the entire cleaning management process. Say goodbye to the hassle and hello to high-quality, timely turnovers that guarantee those top-rated guest reviews. With Turno, you can automatically schedule, manage, and pay your short-term rental cleaners, ensuring a seamless and efficient operation. And here's the best part. Turno's Cleaner Marketplace boasts over 55,000 vetted short-term rental cleaning pros ready to elevate your property management game. Turno lets you manage cleaner performance with features like auto scheduling synced directly to your booking calendar, auto payments, photo checklists, problem reporting, and even inventory management. But that's not all. Keep your cleaner communications organized with centralized chat and photo sharing all in one convenient place. Plus, they've made on-the-go management a breeze with separate mobile apps tailored for both hosts and cleaners. And just in case you need a lifeline, Turno's live 24-7 customer support is always at your service. Because at Turno, they're not just a platform, they're your partner in success. And there's a special treat for the listeners of Alex and Annie podcast. When you try Turno and its cleaner marketplace, you'll receive a $150 Amazon gift card exclusively as our thank you to you. So here's how it works. New users can sign up at turno.com slash Alex Nanny podcast. Search for a cleaner in your area, connect with one or more, and then complete a marketplace cleaning. Once you see how easy and simple cleaning management can be, you'll love how much time and money you save, not to mention no more cleaning headaches. Now back to the show. Through acquisition, the guys that have been successful leave their egos at the door. They really do rely on the local guys. And yeah. sometimes through acquisition comes inflated ego. Oh, I, we're spending the money. We've got the money. Therefore, we know what's best. And that's not true. You got to be there. You know, I preach and we preach here that the inverted pyramid, where if you're really the senior leadership, you're at the bottom of that pyramid. It's upside down and you're supporting those layers within your company and those guys with the boots on the ground. 
They make the best decisions. They're in the fields they know. But the guys successful at it leave their egos at the door and will continue to. And that, to me, is what makes them successful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah, a okay. great point, Paul. And I was kind of leaning in that direction, Annie. I, I agree with what you said about you know Vacasa. We need them to succeed as an industry. We I, we're all really pulling for them. Yeah. But, but hospitality, you can't fake. Okay, it's got sure. to be authentic at every level, whether it's your technology or whether it's your operating model or whether it's your local you know uh, folks. But you know, I, I point to a couple of things. When when I left Wyndham, uh, I I handed the keys to my boss uh, at the uh, uh, to my boss to hand over to Vacasa, a fully functioning, highly profitable, really good, you know, hospitality culture. Uh, and literally I said to Bob Milne, who's the one I, at Vacasa, I told that I was not making the turn uh, before the deal was, was, uh, was inked. And I said, Bob, you don't have to touch a thing. This is like an ATM machine, you know, and they, they can't help adjusting things that really don't need to be messed with. <laughs> Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh, no. so technology it should be in the shadows and it should be just functioning, but it doesn't yeah. have a name, a face or anything. It should be just producing great efficiencies or good results on behalf of your owners and guests. They they switched uh, to, I guess it was called Vacasa Suite at the time, housekeeping and, and all the like. And my uh, my housekeeping managers were calling me in tears because they they lost visibility into their day to day. And on the very first weekend of conversion, one of my top housekeeping managers in the Gulf Shores, Orange Beach area, she missed 12 cleans on a Saturday in season, six of which were owner arrivals. Oh, she, my God. Oh, literally in tears, distraught. And right. so uh, I called Bob and I said, Bob, you, you really need to give her a call. And, and understand from her perspective, the tools that she now does not have access to. Yeah. Uh, and, um, but they felt like their technology was better, their processes were better, and they weren't listening to the people doing the job every day. Paul, mm-hmm. to your point, that's where an ego can ruin your business. Mm-hmm. Because mm-hmm. I, whenever I need to change something in, in our businesses, I talk to the people doing the work every day first. So, you know, it's interesting, you know, that's when Jim came in the business, he spent the first six months in the business. He was he was the president working for Bill Abbott. Bill Abbott was he was coming in. Bill Abbott was hiring as a, a new C suite, and Jim cleaned units. Got fired from by Dot out at uh, he did. Yeah. Dot. Was Dot fired me at main <laughs> sale? <laughs> I was, uh, she fired me from cheap uh, fitted sheet folding. I couldn't fold them up and make them look good. Not she even. Said, you you were off this line. Go work in the Terry's. I Who can fill know. the fitted sheet though? Really? Come on. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but with, but there, it, this is a true story. story. The, yeah. the, oh my goodness. The, the, yeah. you know, I was talking about when we built the underlying parts to that. That yeah. was that was done by housekeeping uh, ex- executive housekeepers, and, and it was us in the field sitting with the maintenance and the housekeeping teams, yeah. building the tools that would become those reports that ultimately you were using. That was done at a grassroots level to build up to say, how do you run the business? So you're, you're spot on. And, and, and it's when you, when you understand the nature of the business, cause you've done it, you know, it's the same with soft software people that are writing software. I remember when we took over, uh, when I took over a CIO and I walked out to the first resort folks and I asked them how many people, you know, what business are you in? And, well, I'm a customer service. I'm a this. And I, and I reminded them they're all in the hospitality business. And, and many of those people are writing front desk check-in software and have never checked into a unit, much less stood next to somebody. Yeah, oh, well, yeah, yeah. And, and, and that's how we got V12, which was actually version 12 at one point, but there were like seven version 12s. Right. That's <laughs> such a long time ago. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I was there. I, I literally will remember V12 and Tom Letty giving the presentation in Basalt, Colorado. Couldn't oh, breathe wow. for two days, man. <laughs> but we, we built tools that, that were collaborative with yep. front desk people. We built tools that were collaborative with, with housekeeping managers. Those tools matter and it has to function. And it has to function perfectly on a back-to-back turn weekend. Mm-hmm. Right? It, can't, it can't fail. 12 unclean units is a disaster. That's a disaster. Yeah. 12 owners. Taking that all into consideration, and I think we're all on the same page that the local operators have a better chance of winning right now. One topic that's come up a lot, I would say probably in the last five years, has been the standardization and the professionalism of the industry and you know who's going to tackle it and when 
Marriott Homes and Villas came in. There was attention there. The franchise model has had attention to it as well. But it's it's a very hard thing to do because there, there's just no way an operator in Myrtle Beach is going to operate the exact same way in Denver, Colorado. So how do you feel that we can ever get to that point? Should we even bother trying to get to that point? What can be standardized versus what do we need to maybe communicate better as a brand of what vacation rentals are that we are a mixed bag? <laughs> you know, I, I think it's a great, great question, but Jim, yeah. you know, sort of hit on the, the, the things we can do, right? Think about thread counts, think about, you know, quality, you know, of, of toilet papers and disposables and the like, you know, when we rolled out, Jim, uh, the platinum, gold, silver, silver, oh, bronze yeah. back in the early this. 2000s, Ooh. there's, there's about 15 oh, funny oh, stories I could give you. Our system, Steve set it up so that like say Lino gave somebody a gold and the, the same unit next door is a platinum. The platinum will get more bookings because oh, yeah. we tell the computer that they're not getting any. Right. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was it's great to compete against that. I tell you, it's it's such a subjective model, right? You know, because yeah. a platinum yeah. in Destin at Sun Destin is different than a platinum in Destin at Emerald Towers, which is right next door, by the way. Yep. Yeah, you know? and, yeah. and so and it's start, different, start, and it's different again to a house in the Outer Banks, right? Yeah, and start oh, taking it across yeah. the country. You know, you, you you can't standardize on a on a thing like that. It's got to be something based in reality, and and the That's quality true. of the yeah. you know the the supplies and the like can really matter. I don't know that it's as necessary anymore because you're able to yield manage and and really get you know the better units are going to perform better because they're getting right. a higher rate versus. Yeah. Trying to tell a customer that that the platinum that you stayed in in Telluride is going to be mm -hmm. the same as the platinum you get in Panama City, you right. know, I think not, that's wrong way. not apples to apples for sure. Yeah. <laughs> but I think what Marriott has come in and done is it, it's about having a service attitude. Part of that agreement, that onerous agreement that I, that we work through, and, and we're partners, and they've been a great partner on us. And I think one of the things they put a focus on though is about service standards and expectations that their customers expect and living to that. So I think it's about enforcing not a gold, platinum, bronze level of a unit. I think it's 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 really about standard standardizing on quality of product in the unit that that the guests experience, it's about guest experience and attitude towards the business on how you approach it. And it has to be a service level. And I think Paul, you're right. It's, it's an inverted pyramid that that works. If you have that as your service standard and we standardize that of when you stay in a short-term rental, you're going to get a service level that's second to none. That's a standard that we can apply across the industry. And you guys all know, I mean, in, in a lot of cases, some of your best reviews and best clients or guests come from when things go wrong because you have that opportunity to fix it for them. So it's like, you know, really taking that at the core of the hospitality, the guest experience and having that just sense of, you know, being creative on how you're going to fix a problem it, problem solving in general is, is part of our industry and goes a long way. So it doesn't have to be everything in a box and it's exactly the same way. Well, you bring up, Alex, that's a good point because, um, you know, Marriott's a great company and standardization belongs there. But, you know, when Marriott bought the company I worked with out in the desert, Renaissance Hotels, you know, if you, if you had a challenge with a guest, if you want to know what the answer was, it was in a binder on the shelf behind you. <laughs> you know, that's that's a little too far and that's why i got into the vr space is you you touch on a great point that all our guests have these individual problems we have to attack them individually yeah. and it's very important that guest satisfaction because the other thing that's changed that we're not talking about is our guest expectations have changed mm -hmm. dramatically you know, if you overcook a cheeseburger, they want a week free in a in a four bedroom home. And, <laughs> well, that's and, that's reasonable. What are you talking about, <laughs> Paul? You're the only one that overcooks it. You're yeah. the only one. We all know I'm that. looking through Paul next time. <laughs> yeah, right. But our guest expectations have changed dramatically, and and I don't want to throw out the word entitlement, but many of these guests show up with a chip on their shoulder, ready to get something for free. And yeah. back twenty years ago, or even to Jim's point, when he was around 50 years ago, it's different. Now. It's a different animal. We deal with uh, different problems and, and these yeah. problems get escalated very highly, very quickly, where they used to be much more reasonable problems to be dealt with, with reasonable people. And I well, think social media has changed that. Yeah. Social yeah. media has allowed that instantaneous, yep. get it out to the masses kind of mentality. But we can, 
we can standardize a few things. Yeah. I, I don't I don't I don't agree with the whole idea of pure standardization because that's one of the niches. That's why my wife and I travel. We want to see different things at different right. places. Right. I don't want everything black and white and vanilla, but one is I think it's ridiculous that every state in the United States has a different set of rules that they keep changing for our industry. Agreed. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I understand. I agree. We we kind of snuck up between timeshare and hotels and we weren't anything, but to have to have 700 broker licenses in North Carolina and do 17 different steps and then drive down the street to Florida and have to do virtually nothing. But then you have this whole deal with the rules about, you know, uh, safety and all that. I think safety and, and local regulatory, if we could just find a way to get those two in our industry, because we don't control the asset at the level. And that's what worries me about the safety aspect. We don't control the asset yeah. at the same level that a hotel does. And that, that, could, that could end up biting us. I think okay. regulatory is a response to the fact that you know, I had a history teacher in the high school used to say is control yourself or be controlled, right? Right. Yeah. And we don't organically set a standard that is that is guest friendly, that isn't that isn't uh, that isn't driving uh, legislatures to to want to regulate, right? If we regulate ourselves, that the the need to regulate us will go down. And, okay. and while we need to be active and 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 I you know I'm a I'm a big believer in right to rent and the and the whole ownership and the value of an owner having a unit and their their ability to rent their units out but that you can't do that irresponsibly and you have to be a good neighbor you have to operate in your community in a way it goes back to that local ownership and understanding how to be part of the community and if we did that well everywhere those those regulations and the noise for that would go down yeah I, I believe. Being responsible. Speaking my language there, uh, you know, on the regulatory stuff, you know, I've been involved for many years at the yeah. FRLA level in Florida yeah. and government affairs with BRMA. And you just hit on really the heart of our issue as an industry. When you look at hotels, you look at timeshares, their lobbying entities nationwide and their associations mm -hmm. are airtight, solid. Yeah. Every hotel brand is involved deeply and, and we're very fragmented. We tend to not get together and get involved until something punches us in the face or threatens to shut down our business or add significant additional expense to it uh, on, a, on a thin margin already. And I think that's one of the areas that as an industry, we really have to get serious about because what happens locally, as you guys all know, is that one or two local residents come into these meetings with voting power for the folks sitting on those councils, these little city councils. Yep. Uh, and we've got a whole mess of owners that are absentee and we're their only voice. So if yep. we all as business owners can't get together and be that voice with the voting authority on those local councils, then we're never going to get to that you know, next level. And some of these local uh, councils, the, if you put the right people in those chairs, it might be a difference of a couple of dozen votes yep. that you have gotten for 400 bucks versus something getting all the way to the state level with right. hundreds of thousands of dollars that it would take to, you know, to enact change. So one thing we talk about quite a bit on the show too, is just the lack of the two sides of the industry, the legacy companies with the newer STR people that have bought it in the last you know five years or so. And there's just, there's not really an event or one association that has done a, even a decent job of bringing them together. I know that there was, maybe this, that could be Atma's <laughs> The comeback of Atma, because <laughs> think about it. I mean, Atma was, I mean, geared towards the on-site condo resorts. And they were having the worst problems back then, and they're still having probably the worst problems now with those off-site owners. Is a significant problem. Maybe this is a good topic for everybody to weigh in on. Like, what do you think is our opportunity? Well, there is the opportunity we've identified it. How do we bring those two sides together? One thing that Alex and I've done a couple of panels since the beginning of the year, and one of them in particular was women in the STR space. And overwhelmingly, there was 200 plus people on, on this particular session that we were in that they didn't know where to go to get information. Mm -hmm. VRMA is not reaching them. And there's not an association on the STR side. And yep. again, I bring it up often. If you look at the pie that, that we as the professional side occupy, it's very much outweighed by these STR these individuals, these smaller groups who, again, if they don't have access to information and they don't know what they're doing, they're all making it up as they go along. 
which we know can be bad, can be good. I mean, sometimes they're creating new, you know, new innovative ways to do stuff, but a lot of times they're just creating more problem if they just had the information and had access and had education. So how do we, how do we as the professional side open up and invite them in and make them understand that like, again, together, we can prevent some of these things that are frustrating all of us. That's a good question. I think there's a number of us that have you know influence over large numbers of companies and and or locations. And the extent that we can, we, we should put our money where our mouth is and we should participate, right? And I think we can all get busy sometimes and we forget that that what you're talking about is super, super important. So I, I think we there are some organizations out there, particularly on the advocacy side, that I think we should support. I think that's one step. I think that could be, uh, I, I think we should have a consortia of some of the larger players out there talking regularly, not not to collude and to set pricing, but to, to set standards and to set uh, standards of practice. And, and, and we can't hold everything to ourselves. I think there are, there's a lot of experience, there's a lot of best practice that if we shared that, and, and there was a forum to share that, it would lift the industry up. And, and new operators that are coming in wouldn't make up new things that that are tried and true and rather put their energy into things that are you know don't make the mistakes i've made make find some new areas to blaze new ground right don't make the same mistakes over and over again and that that's a critical piece i i wish our our associations that are out there would step into that but for for right or for you know for whatever reason you know i think usually it's just bureaucratic roadblocks that keep us from getting there and yeah. i think we have put some egos aside and, and build that up. Sure. Yeah, one of the series that I really have enjoyed is Brooke Fouts uh, put together, a, a, you know, top mistakes in the industry. Yep. Mm -hmm. He just yeah. recently did one about, you know, the property, ma the uh, rental management agreements, you know, and get some, you know, sharing of, of those kind of things. That's a great first step. And, and yeah. maybe he's the vehicle or if we can all, you know, help, you know, proliferate some of those uh, things that he's working on, because that's exactly what he's trying to do is bring yeah. the industry together. Let's and start get to start an association. I think we should start there. Yeah, we've talked about yeah. that actually. <laughs> yeah. have, have, you guys <laughs> ever, have you guys ever gone to an ARTA convention? Oh yeah. No. I I I yeah. ARTA ARTA's got their act so together. Now yeah. I haven't been in a while, but it's the timeshare industry. Yeah. American Resort Development Association. And let me tell you something. That's a group that is about as competitive and bloodthirsty as you will get in yeah. any industry. And everything is sales and closings and financing. But you go to an art convention and you feel like it's one gigantic happy family. Yeah. And they're they're mm -hmm. sharing data, hard data, not just garbage. I mean, the whole time you're there, you're learning. Now they they started a little different than us, but they go through a lot of the same things. Okay. And we should be we're mature enough that we should have an art at that level. I mean, I love going to art conventions. I learned more there than I did at any other one I ever went to. Any other convention, anything. You know, when when Jim started that, I thought he was referencing AARP. Since he's <laughs> <laughs> I'm not, I'm not going to hold my hand with the member. <laughs> I got He's a, a spokesman. <laughs> yeah. I am not a member of AARP, but I am on Medicare. Yeah. I made it. Well, you said that those conferences are so good. What's different as far as the content there? I mean, are they talking more also about hospitality, something that we've talked a lot about today? It, it's all, it, well, the timeshare industry is so weird. Alec, they talk a lot about the financing part because that's where they make their most money. But yeah. the convention itself, is a, it, it, everybody walks in, the attitude in the room is, let's figure out how to make ourselves better as an industry. Yeah. Let's talk about the problem, the pain points. They still hate each other when they get out in the real world <laughs> and start beating each other up, yeah. but they have their own set. What hurts me is our industry hasn't gotten me, and I'm not bashing Verma. I never went to Verma until I started doing the m &A. We just didn't go. We were so big. We were kind of having to forge it ourselves. But I mean, the conference I've been to have been great. The data conference to me has always been one that yeah. I walk away with a bunch of stuff. Okay. Yeah. Because we venture so far out of data uh, at those meetings that are so good and a ton of hallway knowledge too, which is good. In the old days, the software, I know the first resort forum, it goes yep. way, way, way back in that the, used to be at the, uh, the Aspen Institute. You know, there was a, an attempt to educate. And so back then they had a 40, 45 percent market share of software. And I think a lot of the software companies out there today, some of the bigger ones are doing shows still. You know, Streamline has one. Uh, iTrip does one. It's a very collaborative event. 
I, I unfortunately those events are just isolated to those communities. I think there are events that are happening in small pockets that if we could capture that energy that comes from those mm -hmm. and move those into into the mainstream, I think there's yep. there, there's a format for it already built, and I think it's just not it's not touching the whole industry, and we have to find a way to make that happen. Well, but, I don't know, guys. There's a lot we got to talk. about. Yeah, no, so good. So good. We so we, we, we have one question that we were really excited to ask all of you guys today. And I think we asked uh, Lena when you came on the show. I don't remember if we asked you, Steve. I don't think we did. But we want to go around the room. What advice would you give your 25 year old self looking back now over all these crazy years that you've had in the business? If I've had any success in my career, it's building relationships. So I would go back and I've got three 20 whatever year olds right now. I would I would encourage myself back then or anybody in that age to be a bridge builder and help people get to a place they can't get on their own. And if you look out for others and are honest and true to others and help others and answer calls and just be there for others and collaborate, it, it'll take care of itself from then on because you'll be yeah. you'll be great, great with guests. You'll be great with uh, colleagues and just take care of those around you and those you interact with and everything will work out just fine. Agreed. Well said. <laughs> Be curious enough to not just stay in your lane a little bit, but to, and to try to understand what other parts of the business are doing. If you come in this business and you're an ops person or you're a technology person, to broaden your view a little bit and really, really understand how it all comes together. And that's in my early days, I was a technologist and it wasn't until Jim and I started Sterling that I really started crossing those barriers and right. uh, and and working across large parts of the business and understanding. And I think the leaders of, of the industry need to have a wide focus of how it all works mm -hmm. so that when we get into this kind of discussion about how do we lift the industry up, you can talk across across vertical parts of the, of the business. If you get too narrow, um, you can be an expert in one thing, but you, it's hard to, it's hard to be relevant across the business. If you want to lead one of these, you have to clean some toilets, right? You've got to yep. you got to understand just how hard it is to fold a fitted sheet, and and what it takes for a marketing person to to to, to be successful in driving SEO. And if you don't if you don't get in and do some of that and cross that barrier, you don't know. And and if you don't Very know, true. it's hard to have a valid opinion about it. Oh. I would have bought more condos earlier as well. That was yeah. Yeah, we all would own thirty A, right? I can hold on to those a lot longer, right? Yep. <laughs> yep. Don't forget that we're in the hospitality business and have fun. This is not rocket science. This is really right. about delivering great experiences consistently to other people. And and Paul, I love what you just said about bridge building. Uh, I've got my next generation starting at Scenic Stage. She's uh, my daughter. Uh, graduated um, December of last year and started with Scenic. Uh, and um, she's on her, I think, her 10th week now. And uh, we had the conversation just the other day about being a bridge builder. Don't don't think you know everything, even though you just come out of college. Stop and learn something new every day, you know. Right. And so it's exciting to see a, a, another strong hospitality woman coming up in the uh, in the industry. That's great. Well, it sounds like an Alex Haney show coming up to me. It, it does. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Yeah. We should get the we children. Should do a family. <laughs> we should get a family in the business. You'd have to have mine all over the place. They're all. You know. <laughs> Jim I and I have an interesting is. tree. Yeah. The OG's got, offspring. My tree's a little weird. I got some roots in there. Let me tell you. Um, <laughs> I will tell you this. I'm blessed to have Bill Abbott as my mentor You're here. for this industry. Uh, is just I got luck, just flat mm -hmm. out lucky. I mean, I got the Bill hired me, but his business acumen, and I'm not just talking about this space. Bill, Bill, who to me is one of the founders of the industry, he just lived off of if it's fair, do it. Yeah. Okay. And I could tell you story after story of him leaving millions on the table because he didn't feel like it was fair to take. It wasn't illegal, wasn't immoral. He just didn't agree. And if a guest had a problem and he felt like they were that was correct, he'd give him he'd give him his house. And I learned that kind of mentality and that kind of uh, service. Now he got older and he said, "I've had enough," and he hired me and so forth. But. I was able to keep that all the way through. And Bill's other thing was Bill surrounded himself, and this is going to sound very egotistical. He sound, he surrounded himself with people smarter than him in the sense of, I'm not going to do it. I need the best. So when he brought in Joanne Saucier to do it, Joanne's the best, okay? Uh, you know, when you get down to that 
nitty gritty running managers everywhere and, and, you know, 250, 500 turn uh, back to backs. Nobody better. He screwed up with me, but I'll take it. Nah, <laughs> I don't know. It made it easier for you to hire people smarter than you. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> except you, Steve. I was oh. being nice. Lino, yes. You, no. Nah. <laughs> well, if, you know, you know, if you're not failing nine out of 10 times, you're not trying hard enough. Yeah. That's right. That. Well, out and there. I think. Yeah. And I think Make I hadn't heard the word yet, but the, the common thread or a common thread among the six tiles I'm looking at is everyone on this today has a passion for this business mm -hmm. and they care about it. And they, again, it's answering the phone at 11 o'clock at night and checking in on your partners and making sure everybody's doing okay. And then we all are, we all care about this in industry. That's yeah. why we got into it. And it's not the same across the board, but this group and others like us, I mean, we, we live it. We love it. You have to because it's 24-7. So we all have a passion for it. And that's that's a great, great asset. Well, thank you guys so very much for having us here today. This is probably one of the more unique uh, formats that we've had. Uh, just a wonderful conversation. And I, I I met all of you, actually, Annie included, at Opma. So that was a very good thing for me back in the day. Um, but just, just grateful for all of you and what you do for the industry and for joining us. And I know our listeners are going to really get a lot from what you shared today. That's it. Thank hey, you. you guys. We appreciate all you do. Yep. What you guys are doing is phenomenal. So outstanding girl. Thank, thank you for supporting you. us. And we will have you back for OGs part two later this <laughs> year. <laughs> <laughs> it's a series. <laughs> we'll put everybody's contact information. So if I would go around the room right now. So if anybody wants to reach out to any of these four gentlemen, just go to the the show notes. Um, in the meantime, if you want to reach out to Annie and I, you can go to alexandannypodcast.com. And until next time, thanks for tuning in, everyone. Mm -hmm.